Welcome to TEN, the Tenant Experience Network. I'm your host, David Abrams. In this episode, we are connecting with David Sterner, Principal Senior Managing Director at Banyan Street Capital. In this episode, we learn that David entered the family business and built a successful career in commercial real estate. He attributes some of his success to his father, who served as an early mentor. David shares how the pandemic affected Banyan's business and created an opportunity to pivot in their business by converting office spaces to residential. David firmly believes in the adage, adapt or die, because he understands that markets will change and we must continually be thinking about what needs to be done in order to keep up. We discuss the paradigm shift that is taking place in the New York office market and David's thoughts on the long-term impact of how buildings are used and how building operators must compete by adopting hospitality service and new technologies to drive future success. We are excited to share this podcast with you, so be sure to subscribe to TEN so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome David to the show. I'm really glad you could be with us today. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for uh, having me today. No problem. Um, So I'm really curious and interested to learn about your journey to your current position and role. Tell me how you got started. Well, I was born in Red Bank, New Jersey. No, I won't do that. Um, <laughs> I graduated Boston University with a marketing degree in, in 1989. You know how useful that was. It probably earned $16,000 a year, which didn't even pay for my food for the year. Um, but my passion was always in real estate. My father had formed this firm in 71. Um, it was a very small owner only. We didn't even operate at the time. We gave out those services to either Cushman or Wakefield or Williams, or even actually the last ones were George Comfort and Sons, which was a, an actual owner operator as well. Uh, but they had a brokerage arm and, and they had, a, they had a little bit more of a turnkey, um, vertically integrated firm. Um, when my father uh, asked me what I wanted to do and I said, I want to join his firm, he said, no, you have to go learn something we don't know. And <laughs> at the time he was buying a lot of half empty properties downtown um, and knew he, there were going to be large capital requirements. So he said, go learn construction. So I went and worked for a company called Structure Tone. It's one of the, I think it's the 20th larger, uh, largest GC in the world. They do over $3 billion in interiors. Um, they also have a ground-up arm under Pavarini, as well as another number of hosts of uh, other companies they own across the country and the world. Um, I believe they're in England and a few other countries um, in um, Western Europe. Um, so I learned that uh, pretty detailed skill set. After seven and a half years, I left and came to join Murray Hill and I formed the project management or owner's rep for the lack of a better word. um, And the asset management group, as well as the brokerage. And we became a vertically integrated firm and rebranded ourselves from Murray Hill properties, which was the ownership entity to MHP real estate services. Uh, We ran for over 20 years together. My father and I, I became the COO after forming all the firms and ran the company with him and uh, his partners, Neil Sidero and Michael Green. And they um, retired and it ended up just my father and I. And we were probably in our, in our sixth fundraise. We actually not only did all the turnkey real estate functions, um, we identified the opportunities we underwrote and executed, but we also raised our own funds. They were predominantly general GP funds. So mm. normally somewhere between five and 15% of the equity necessary for a deal. And we'd go and seek a larger institutional LP to buy the larger and larger properties. Um, at one point, we had a portfolio of over eight and a half million square feet. We were the 16th largest manager. As time went on, we were having problems finding sense in the market and, and understanding pricing and valuation. Uh, in the business we were in, which was the added value business, we had to somewhat come in at a undervalued price and, and come in and add value. And most of our funds were driven by um, IRR performance. So the lack, the, the space and time was as important as how much the value escalated from our improvements. So that business started to become more difficult as pricing and valuations of these commercial offices just rose. So we found that we had enough people interested in buying our platform, not necessarily the real estate, but the uh, platform that produced all the fees around our portfolio, as well as the team that identified the opportunities and underwrote and executed them. Um, you can imagine companies coming out of uh, other areas that were not New York and the high barrier to entry. Buy into our platform, certainly a great way to uh, get there. And my father happened to be one of the icons of real estate for 50 years. So there was a brand, there was a name, and we were quite successful. Um, 
So we ended up selling the firm, um, went through a process. We had a, a few suitors, um, some with larger prices uh, than who we ended up going with. But uh, we chose Banyan Street Capital for very, uh, um, various amount of reasons. But the, the biggest reason was Rudy Tuze, the CEO. Um, he, he, he's, he's just very bright, um, knows the business inside and out, has seen all sides of it, including running Christian Wakefield Southeast. Um, office for I think over 15 years as well so it, it, he was just the right partner um, for what we wanted to do going forward and we all had aligned interests in what and what we wanted to accomplish in this partnership so four years later we have not bought a property mm -hmm. um, and then the pandemic hits right ultimately in hindsight not buying properties yes it shrunk our platform obviously we continued to reduce size because our portfolio size was you know, getting smaller with every sale and not purchasing any new properties. But looking back, we are so blessed right. that we did not overpay for the pleasure of these B and C class properties, which are the ones we were, you know, or B plus, we started to move up in scale, certainly. But we are blessed that we did not pay the pleasure of owning these properties because clearly there's a real difficulty in that market right now. And what my partner did, uh, he, he came to me in the summer of 2020 and said, what are we going to do? Clearly, the business we're in and what we've come into for, from, for New York was commercial office added value. I said, you're right. I said, what we're going to do is we're going to pivot. We're going to enter the commercial to resi conversion business. Mm -hmm. This was way before some of the New York City initiatives to go into public and affordable housing. You know, a lot of talk, but nothing tangibly had happened um, with the... Um, new mayor, Eric Adams, this is one of his biggest mantras. Beyond gun control and violence, he needs to produce a tremendous amount of housing, including affordable housing, throughout the boroughs, but specifically in Manhattan. Um, there's obviously uh, a change in the di you know, dynamic of the people that lived in Manhattan, people who could afford it. That has actually created such a wealth gap that all these side street buildings, you know, the retail in them, they're empty. There's mm -hmm. no one to support those type of businesses and there's no one to patron them. Mm -hmm. So I actually have been speaking with some people and creating this task force where we're actually talking to Eric about forming a, a group of private individuals, private citizens that are in the real estate business to identify these properties that can easily be converted from commercial office to affordable housing. So I've basically kind of squoze together a, a period of 28 years right. uh, very quickly. Yeah. So yeah. maybe if you have any questions about that <laughs> path, uh, yeah. you can start, start asking. All right. Well, first of all, you're, you're right. It's an incredible journey and, and certainly interesting. So again, you know, you started out, you had no idea where you would end up and where you would be today, but what do you think and why do you think you were so uniquely suited to this opportunity? So what has helped you? First of all, to become successful, to identify these opportunities, to, to know when to pivot. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Well, first and foremost, my father, who instilled into me since I was four years old, we would drive into the city for dinners and he would walk, drive by these buildings and go, yeah, bought that. Yeah, we just bought that. <laughs> and, and it excited me um, right. just so it was ingrained really in, in, in me. Um, I would tell you the construction background, knowing the field mm -hmm. is extremely important in the business we're in, um, even more important in the resi conversion business. Um, you know, and, and I would go further. I actually spoke about six months before the pandemic hit. And because our story is so unique that we changed from an owner operator to a, I should say an owner to an owner operator, raising our own funds, then looking for funds on, uh, you know, uh, to, to apply our, our magic, um, I, I, my, the theme of my speech was adapt or die. Right. And I truly have always built my theories around the changing market and what do we have to do to keep up with it? Because you, you just can't be a one trick pony. You can't sit there and for 30 years and expect to be successful with, with, with one idea and, and one way of doing business. Um, so you know, again, it was a combination of three things. My father, the, the skill set, and, and maybe an, in, an innate ability to realize things are changing. Um, I would say a little bit of luck in that I was right a lot of the times. 
Um, but uh, ultimately, I, I, I do give a lot of credit to my father and, and what he taught me in the first 10 years of my career in Murray Hill Properties and MHP Real Estate Services. Well, lucky you, lucky to have such a great mentor and clearly a friend and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a father. So uh, I love that story. Um, and I guess, although you were in very, you know, you, you know, I'm a founder of a technology startup and you've been in commercial real estate, there are many commonalities in terms of, you know, uh, knowing how to transition your business, knowing when you might have to take that pivot, raising money. Um, so, you know, a lot of common uh, elements for sure. Absolutely. And certainly a lot of integration now with technology driving all of real estate. Absolutely. And we'll talk more about that. Um, so listen, there's a lot of commentary around the return to workplace and, and certainly some extreme opinions being expressed it can be confrontational, it can be polarizing. Uh, my team and I, we really believe that everyone needs to live and work in the world as it is right now. Uh, the commercial estate industry and its employers, we can't continue to project to a date in the future. Um, we really believe that if this is the new normal, we have to figure out how to do business today. Um, so I'm just curious what you think that means for the commercial real estate industry. Uh, and then we'll unpack a couple of other questions as well. Well, as, as you suggested, there's a lot of confrontation. Um, we give you a quick story. March hits. Now, as our platform shrinks, our brokerage business was driven by our portfolio. Yes, mm -hmm. a lot of agency business out of our, you know, doing leases within our, our own buildings. But when a tenant just didn't renew or shrunk or had to go somewhere else because of the size constraints, we got that business as tenant rep. So there was a lot of trickle down business coming from and residual business from our base core business and, and the real estate portfolio we owned. As it continued to shrink, that area of business shrunk for us. And I'll go further. Our guys specialized in two to 10,000 square footers. Right. Those are done predominantly in the B, you know, maybe B plus properties. The larger buildings, they, they have a lot more full floor tenancies and, and large block tenants. And that business indicatively would, went, went down because those businesses either were working fully remotely or didn't know the future of their space needs and went into flex space, which right. now that business is being buoyed by this new mantra. So when I would speak, I said, this is a paradigm shift. I said, commercial office, especially the B and C, is in real trouble. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I, I don't see how remote is going to change. I think you can say the executives or the people that need to be, um, you know, together to, to collaborate. Yeah, they're going to be in the office. And, and even more importantly, if they live in the city, it's easy for them to commute. Mm -hmm. They'll go to the office just to get out of the monotony of sitting in their apartments. But a third of the workforce is administrative right. and they don't necessarily have to be in the office. And as a matter of fact, they travel an hour or an hour and a half each way. It's a miserable existence to try to commute. The mm -hmm. cost, the cost of lunch, the cost of your time. I have discussed this with a myriad of people I was letting go and they felt working from home was not only more productive, but more enjoyable. And that's the shift. The quality of life is more important to that staffer than right. the money because the money can be saved through no commuting, no lunches. And more importantly, they're getting all their chores done in between meetings, their kids, they're being more attentive by five or six o'clock. They actually have a life, right? You're not going to change the, the mind of that person. And, and that's why we're seeing either people quitting mm -hmm. or they just are winning the argument that I'm going to work remotely more, more days than you'd like you know, mm -hmm. senior executive, mm -hmm. the talent is going to drive that decision in the future, in my opinion. And I think ultimately you're seeing people drop out of the workforce because they're making more money entrepreneurially online, e-commerce, or just selling things. There is more money certainly to be had and more joy in the fact that they don't have to have the grueling commutes than, than you know, working in the office environment, one that's not the easiest in the world. And two, being usually undervalued and underpaid in that you know, to have that, that privilege. So these were all conversations I had and people argued with me for a couple speeches and I stopped speaking because people right. got upset. Right. A year later, I did a point counterpoint with a guy named Kent Swig. I don't know if you know Swig Equities. Yeah. He's Brown yeah. Harris Stevens. He's, he's an owner of a lot of real estate and real estate firms. And he was one of the guys who argued with me. We got on the point counterpoint and he literally got on the, um, the speaking uh, engagement and said, 
I'd love to be able to argue with David today, but I, I must admit he was right. And it went silent. And even the arguments, and, and it's more affecting the vertical cities like Chicago, San Francisco, and New York with hundreds of millions of square feet of commercial office. Because yeah, the suburban style city is gonna do fine. You know, they, they, Most people are getting in their cars to drive to work anyway. They're not necessarily getting on mass transit, places like Nashville, Austin, Miami. But vertical cities with five, New York City's 500 million square feet. So when one of the comments was, okay, maybe we have a contraction of 10 or 15%. I said, that's 70 million square feet. Right, it's massive. <laughs> it, again, silence, you hear crickets. I, I, don't necess- I didn't wanna be right, but ultimately this is a paradigm shift. It's not, I keep stuttering, but forgive me, I keep yeah. thinking of these conversations on the fly. Every one of them first pointed to look at 2001 and right after 9-11, look at 2008, commercial office came back first, everyone needs an office. And I said, that, that's fine because that was a one day event and you were recovering the next day. You know, I said, yep. this pandemic's still going on. Yes. I said, and we don't know how long. So again, you know, it, 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 everyone called me a pessimist and I had never been that person, especially right. when my father was considered the cockeyed optimist. He right. was never down on New York. <laughs> I mean, right. never. He always right. said we'd be back and everyone loved to hear it from him. And he's been right all the time up until this point. Uh, my father ended up retiring right after about six months of the pandemic. He just said, I just have nothing to offer at this point. I can't go into the office. I, I don't feel comfortable at 80 years old. And, and he hadn't lost the verb to be there. He just kind of lost the will at this point. And he's very happy in his retirement. We, we you know, he couldn't be happier with the decision he made. Um, but, you know, here we are today, um, now pivoting because commercial office is going to struggle so mightily. And the real commercial office that's going to survive is the A, you know, everyone's A, A type property. Everyone's going to be, you know, there's a flight to quality. And, but even the A type property, the A class properties are competing heavily with all the other class A. So leading into your conversation, what has to change? It's exactly that, the technology, the touchless right. environments, um, app driven um, entrance, visitor passing and, and getting around the, the asset. Um, all of this technology is going to be the forefront of class A and, and, and any commercial office that wants to succeed in the future. I will even go the next step and, and that's driving more hospitality um, right. driven experiences where we're talking about bringing concierge services to our building down at 180 Main Lane. It's a 1.2 million square foot building, you know quite well. Yep. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, if we don't, and, and mind you, we're at 90% occupied with leases that extend beyond 10 years, but we have a very large tenant that is up shortly in the next three years. And, and we have to be able to retain them and, and more importantly, attract new tenants that not only love the inherent bones of the building, which is, you know, it's a gorgeous class A property, but it, it needs some work right. and, and to, to really guide itself into the future of what commercial office and class A properties need to be. Yeah. Listen, there's a lot of what you've just shared that I 100% agree with. I think it is a paradigm shift. Um, I do think that buildings have a place in this new um, hybrid uh, work world. Um, So, you know, there are certain things that, yes, they can still be done virtually, but I think in terms of, um, you know, creating opportunities for collaboration, inspiration, helping to build culture, you know, helping to, to build and, and, and sustain great companies. I do think that coming together, um, there's a purpose and a place for that. So can buildings help employers attract and retain the best talent? Um, is there anything that they can do specifically to help them in this effort? I see it now more as a collaborative effort. Um, it's not just, you know, the buildings provide space and the employers have to, you know, they're on their own. What can buildings and employers do together? I touched upon it earlier. It's, it's amenities, it's, mm-hmm. it's engagement, it's experiential, you know, um, events that are going on in the building. Um, the best buildings today are going to have a lot more outdoor space, much more right. um, amenity, um, spread out, um, lounge, more, more relaxing, engaging environments as opposed to the stiff cafeterias and, and you know, a, a video room and a, and a meeting and conference center. You know, those those things most A properties have. It's really how you engage them. And that's where the hospitality, the concierge, the, the, the app, um, you know, yeah. the mobile app system that you provide, 
Um, it's all of those things combined together to create an experience that the tenant and, and their, um, their staff want to come to work. Right. Yeah, I agree. And you've, you've sort of touched right off, you know, connected to my next question, which is, you know, recognizing that buildings are ultimately places for people. And, and we're seeing this, this rise in the need to offer more specific um, and elevated tenant experience. Um, and in fact, that's often becoming the new differentiator. You've talked about different class of buildings. Um, you know, how do you position a, 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 a C or a B or a B plus building, you know, up against an A building? And we believe that experience actually is that new differentiator. Uh, you can be, you know, maybe it's not the best location. Uh, maybe it's not, you know, an A-class building, but your experience can actually be the draw. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not suggesting every B property is going to have to pivot to resi or hotel or, right. or something completely different. Um, but they will have to go above and beyond what mm -hmm. their local class A property that's probably on the corner of their side street. And, and you know, they, they're really going to have to work hard. Um, right. They're going to have to put real dollars, real capital into their properties. And it's just not as easy um, in the Class B side street building. Right, right. Okay, let's take a short break and we will be right back. This episode of 10 is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a rapid deployment tenant engagement platform for the hybrid world. The pandemic has created shockwaves across the commercial real estate industry, and now more than ever, we realize that the most important asset of a building is the people. Building operators and employers now recognize that people want new kinds of spaces, services, and amenities to accommodate a hybrid workforce. Tenant engagement solutions that support the hybrid workforce connecting people to buildings no matter where they are have become a major differentiator as buildings compete to retain current tenants and attract new ones. Hilo empowers forward-thinking building operators to meet this challenge. To learn more about Hilo, visit HiloApp.com. We're back with David Cerner, Principal, Senior Managing Director at Banyan Street Capital. Again, glad you could be with us today. Living through a pandemic has been really challenging for so many, and you've shared some of your journey through this process. Um, but I believe it's also provided an opportunity for us to do better, uh, be better, and ultimately build something better. Now, you have already alluded uh, to sort of a pivot that you are taking professionally, but I'd love for you to share any more details that you can about your business or some part of your business, perhaps more about this re conversion of office to resi, um, you know, something that you are reimagining as a result of the reality we're living through today. Well, the, the, the pandemic has not just touched commercial office, certainly more impactful, but it's touched at all forms of real estate and especially where you live since as we just described, the third of the workforce might be working indefinitely at their homes. So, you know, again, it comes to the luxury lifestyle experiential feel that your buildings can provide. It works the same for residential. We're, we're, we're doing the same type of things. We're thinking about the same ideas. What will attract a tenant? What will keep them there more importantly? And, and moving with those times. Um, so, you know, what I would tell you is, I'm hopeful that the pandemic is on its tail end and that this variant and the next three variants are going to be maybe more transmissible, but less um, deadly and, and health wise, um, not a, as affected. So, so I think this is the verge to what we call, I guess they call herd immunity um, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll help all the unvaccinated get us to a point where we can go maskless. I think it may be by this summer, maybe not in the subway systems or in an elevator, but out in the street, there's just, in my opinion, too many people wearing masks. And I understand it's their choice, no problem. I have, I'm not a person who judges and thinks that they should be taking it off, but I can't wear a mask outside. This is what, I, it, it has to change. And that's the only time we're gonna start to move toward what the new normal looks like. Um, because a new normal can't involve a mask, it just can't. Um, so, you know, again, the, the pivot isn't such a big change. Uh, it's still, you know, the bones of the building that's gonna drive the, the, our desire to to renovate it and having the ability to renovate in the new norm, um, more outdoor space, more um, collaborated areas, and even in the residential buildings, lounges, things that will get the clients and the tenants together is, is important to most people. Um, when they come home, they don't necessarily have to go out every time to either socialize or eat, um, to, to find it within your own home or the ability to uh, bring that element to your home is is instrumental in making sure that your property competes with the you know the local competitors. 
we're, we're, we're seeing or, or hearing the notion of, you know, homes becoming more office-like and um, offices becoming more home-like. It's melding. It's exactly correct. It's what I'm touching on. It's, there isn't much difference. So even on the residential side, you know, do you need not so much a party room, but do you need meeting rooms? Do you need, um, you know, phone booths where people can go down and take private phone calls? Do you need a, a, a small recording studio where people can go and do, you know, Zoom recordings or Zoom interviews? Um, and I think that's yes, really yes, exciting. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> I have actually no response other than that. I can't elaborate. They need all those things. Right. And, and you know, it's, it's what people want today. So do you, do you even imagine that, you know, the conversion from office to, to residential, that even within that, you know, that stack, that it could be 50% still office or 20% still office and 70 or 80 or 50% residential? Am I, am I getting closer? Well, well driving, driving that is zoning. And so a lot of the buildings we're looking at are, have the FAR, which is the, the, the element that tells you what you can build zoning wise, um, are partially resi and part commercial. That's not necessarily by design. I think what you're driving at is something what you, they call, we were called We Live. Do you remember that? Sure. Okay. It didn't succeed. Right. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, because I actually thought it was a good idea. It certainly attracted millennials and the younger folk that felt like this was the, the future. And maybe they were just ahead of their time, because I do believe that is a viable business and I think it will succeed in the future. So yeah, I, 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 the, the real estate in Manhattan, um, certainly the B-class property that has this dual uh, zoning and FAR will fall under the category of having no choice if they can't get a variance for full resi or, or you know, decide to go full commercial. Usually they're inherently, you can do the whole building commercial, but there's a portion of it, usually around two thirds, that you can go residential. Right. Um, not all buildings have that zoning, mind you. A lot of them are pure commercial and that's that's the heavy lift that the city's going to have to deal with. And I point over there because that's that's the, <laughs> I live on the <laughs> side of the water. Um yeah, it, 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 the city is going to have to pivot itself and it's going to have to drop some of the mandates that the community boards have and, and, mm -hmm. and the zoning resolutions have. Um, so until that happens, and, and more importantly, it's still subsidies because the affordable housing aspect is not going to happen to any landlord because in, unless he's incentivized or she's incentivized because ultimately luxury rentals is what's going to drive the highest and best use and the mm -hmm. best return. So to get a, you know, an, a landlord to pivot to partial or even half affordable housing, there's going to have to be substantial subsidies and tax abatements that are not only large in, in, in value, but just, you know, uh, long-term and more importantly, most importantly, transferable. A lot of times when the building is sold, you lose those aspects, which can't be. It it's just has to be removed and, and they have to be able to be more um, fungible, um, for the lack of a better word, again, to, to take that property and, and use it and, and bring the most value to it and, and having that ability to bring the most value to that, to that asset. So. Right. All right, David, some great insights. Uh, our closing speed round and an opportunity to get to know you, David, a little bit better. Um, can you share one way in which the pandemic has changed your outlook on life? I, I haven't changed my life, but I've changed the way I work. I'm still probably putting in 80 hour work weeks. I, I've always put in a large amount of hours, whether I was in the office or not. Um, I, I am never not available to my partners or my tenants. I mean, it doesn't bother me to have to respond to something even at eight or nine at night. It, it, it's almost an addiction to, to, to my, in, my, my, my inner person. I, 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 I'm a person that wants to respond. I, I want to help, but um, more importantly, I don't want my workload to pile up. So I like to get it off the desk right. Right, really quickly. Uh, but done. my life hasn't changed other than I'm watching my children who graduated college and, and my wife's children uh, right. grow up and, and, and establish their own careers. And I'm certainly putting more focus on them, but it hasn't stepped, it hasn't changed my life and in the, in the fact that I've always felt that way. And even when they were children and I was divorced young, and but I was always out there. I mean, thank God my ex and I had a great relationship and she didn't mind me being even in the weekends, I wasn't. Um, it wasn't my weekend. She encouraged me to be more active and be involved. And I was, and, and it, it, it's an impact that I can see with my children that they weren't, they weren't at all affected negatively by our divorce. And as a matter of fact, they're both thriving, really happy with their lives. That's a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, what travel destination do you miss most? Europe. I haven't yeah. been overseas in two years and my wife and I love to, to go to Europe and we'll, we're doing planning trips more on the spot um, mm -hmm. based on these 
variants. Obviously, we don't want to have uh, trouble getting home. Um, you know, the, the requirements of testing now are just really stretch the imagination. And, and God knows you could get stuck in a foreign country without any home, um, right. without a place to stay. So it's a little bit more frightening to travel a, a, a abroad. Um, so we're keeping most of our trips domestic, although we have gone to just recently, we went to Costa Rica and, mm -hmm. but we, we did it as a family. We did not go to the restaurants. All 10 of us stayed in one house. Uh, mm -hmm. we had a, you know, we brought in a chef and we, we, mm -hmm. we really did it right and, and made sure we didn't interact too much with anyone else other than outdoors at the beach areas. But we, I could tell you this, we got on our flight and about 20 or 30 people had to stay. They got, oh, wow. they got COVID at Costa Rica. And right. if they didn't, if they didn't have a house like we had and they were in hotels and the hotels were booked, they were staying in government facilities. Oh boy. I have heard some nightmares about yes. them living in these facilities and, and they're not being treated badly. The government's doing the best they can, but right. you can only imagine it's not the level and the lifestyle that they've gone accustomed to. Not the way you want to end a vacation either. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, anything new on your bucket list that you'd like to experience? No. Okay. No. I okay. just want to live my life, even keeled, continue on my, my path. Yeah. It seems to yeah. have steered me right so far. All right. Favorite technology that is new to your life? I, I, I'm not a techie, but I am. Meaning mm -hmm. when the new iPhones come out, I usually want one. I do <laughs> hold myself back because I know how the next technology is coming out six months later. And I hate to be a fool and not get the best and the, you know, that they have. Um, the technology, <sighs> other than Zoom, which is not necessarily new, but certainly right. being more prominent in these days, yeah. uh, video, video chatting like this and mastering what I can look and sound like on, on these videos. <laughs> don't worry. We're going to, we, we can do a lot. You can tell us my perfect view. Maybe I don't know uh, my angle. You can tell us later. We can do a nip, a tuck. We can do a, anything you want. I, it, it, I don't, uh, I don't really care necessarily. All right. All right. Uh, what is your personal choice for days spent in person with your colleagues versus working from anywhere? I, I like a mix. Again, the variety is the spice of life. Um, I, I do believe five days a week is, is, is probably gone forever uh, yep. for everyone. Yep. And I think it's a, I think it's a lifestyle change that everyone appreciates, even the executive that wants everyone in. Um, right. I think they've learned that they may enjoy kind of stepping out unless their home life isn't good. And, and I get that too. Um, I like a good mix. Um, but again, I never put work down. Um, I'm open to working at any moment when it's necessary. And, and I actually really enjoy it. Right. And I think that's what a lot of people had maybe not had that opportunity to experience, i.e. working from anywhere and found that they've been able to. I think that's what they've learned through this entire process. So Absolutely. Um, I do think you're right. Even the executive, I think we're all going to find uh, new ways of working. I think personally, you know, the office, the, the workplace is still important. Um, but I think that we have a wonderful opportunity to redefine what all of this looks like. Um, and like you, I think the experience that buildings offer is going to be a huge driver of, of, of making the building as compelling as, you know, working from home in your, in your pajamas, perhaps. Well, on that note, it really, Think about Europe and, and most countries, um, Latin America, some of the Asian countries and America, no one even thought to put 80 hour weeks in. That was not even a thought in their heads. They, you know, they just don't work like that. They like a mix of, of uh, the quality of life was always important right. to people outside of America and China or right. Japan. And the pandemic actually, I think, shifted some of those thoughts, mm -hmm. certainly in America. And I think people are realizing they'd rather have a quality of life and give up even some money if it's necessary to accomplish mm -hmm. that task. So, mm -hmm. you know, listen, um, th this is still forming. We're only two yes. years out into this, out of this pandemic. Yes. We'll see. We'll see where this, which, which, go, which way we go. But I do believe talent will drive the decision, not necessarily the principal or the executive making the decision. I agree. It's all about the, the everyday person that, that works and lives in buildings. Um, thank you so much for this conversation, David. I look forward to staying in touch. Look forward to hearing more about your journey, more about how your business is evolving. And I hope that we can reconnect and continue the conversation. It's my pleasure. Thanks for the time. And um, it's, been a, it's been my pleasure. Great. Take care now. Bye then. Thank you. I want to thank David Sterner for joining me on this episode of 10. 
and for contributing to the global conversation around buildings being part of a robust ecosystem that can help to build great companies and that they are vital in the effort to cultivate and support great people and teams. The future of the workplace will likely take many forms and we will continue to explore what that looks like together. Subscribe to 10 for more conversations with leading CRE industry professionals and experts who all have something to say about Tenet's experience and the future of the workplace. We love hearing from you, so if you enjoyed this episode of 10, please share, add your rating, and review us through your preferred podcast provider. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live. Thank you.